Good morning, everybody. Hello, and welcome to our Sunday gathering today. We meet in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the risen Son of God. My name is Matthew, and I'm leading our time together today. Welcome back to any who've been away uh, for Easter breaks. I know that a fair few have sort of traveled during the school holidays. It's good to have you back. And welcome any who are here visiting today or um, a newish to church life. It's great to have you with us too. Today we're still celebrating Easter. It was just two weeks ago, uh, two Sundays ago, it was our great uh, Easter celebration, remembering the death and resurrection of Jesus. And we're continuing with that today, thinking about how he was risen and he met with his disciples and how we can believe in him still today. So I'm excited about our time together today. I hope, uh, I hope you are as well. And we're going to begin by singing, singing about how we have wonderful assurances in God's Word. <clears throat> we have His promises for us, which we can hold on to through all life's ups and downs. So if you can, uh, please stand and we'll sing together. Setting off the 
Take your seats. One of the great promises in God's Word for us is that sinners can be forgiven. Those who failed God can be welcomed back. In our Bible passage today, we'll see that very thing happening with Peter. He is forgiven, he is restored by Jesus, and he is an example for us all. So we'll go through that process again this morning, confessing our sin and finding assurance of forgiveness. We'll say it with uh, a prayer together. So bringing to mind our failures this week in thought and word and deed, we come to God asking for forgiveness and restoration. Let's say this prayer together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate faults. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, Forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life to the glory of your name. Amen. At the end of John chapter 20, God's word says this to us. These things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Our Father, we do believe 
Thank you for giving us life in the name of Jesus, for giving us forgiveness from our sins, for the love you have shown us. Give us comfort and assurance today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the Easter season as well, it's good for us to declare again together what it is that we believe about Jesus in particular, about his death and his resurrection, that he is our Lord and Savior. So we'll say together the Apostles' Creed now. Uh, We'll stand to say this in confidence of what we believe. If you're not sure that you do believe these things, no need to join in. But for those of us who do, let's say these words with joy together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Do take your seats. And it's time for our all-age video to get us thinking about the passage today. Let's have that. We'll just be a minute, everyone. Uh, just a bit slower today. Abby, Abby, where's the food? Just be a minute. I'll just be a minute. 24 minutes, 13 seconds. Abby, unless you're fed, you won't be able to feed other people. Take this. Thank you. this afternoon for a lovely meal. Last time the food was a bit lukewarm, but this time it came out piping hot. Thank you, Luke and the team. I love nipping into Luke's for a greasy chip butty. Can't go wrong. Compliments to the chef. Best toast in Fullwood. The queue is a little longer than usual, but the food was well worth the wait. We'll be returning for another hearty meal. Wow, Luke's cafe was popular, wasn't it? We saw that Abby was so hungry that she wasn't able to feed anyone else. And that's a little bit like us. And today, we're going to see how Jesus feeds us so that we can feed other people. Now, we're going to sing a song, an all-age song. So if some kids want to come up to the front to help me with the actions, that would be really great.
done everyone well it's time for our children to head out to their groups we have groups for children up to year nine they all happen over in the church center and they're led by the teams of people in the blue t-shirts so if you're new and would like to join do grab one of them in the atrium and they'll tell you which room you're going into for those who are staying here do say hello to your neighbor if you've not got a bible yet do grab one from the trolleys at the back because we'll need them shortly
Well then, let me interrupt you there. Again, a good warm welcome to any who are new here today. If you are new and you're sort of checking out Church Life, uh, do pop to the welcome table at the back and um, you see there's bits and pieces of information about Church Life uh, groups and ministries that you could join in with if you like. You can also fill in one of our welcome cards there and someone will be in touch with you uh, during the week to, um, uh, to help you find out more about Church Life. Uh, so do do that please if you're new um, and, and just stay on and chat with people afterwards. Uh, we'll be having tea and coffee over in the church centre so, uh, so don't rush off. Just a reminder as always to keep an eye out for church family news uh, when it comes out. We have a, a news sheet and you can get some hard copies at the back but uh, generally they go out in the weekly email uh, or you can find them under the resources section of the, uh, uh, the website. Um, if you're not getting the email and would like to get the email or you thought you were getting the email but you don't seem to be getting it anymore, um, talk to the office. They'd love to sort of deal with any sort of troubleshooting sort of problems to make sure as many people as possible and anyone who wants it does get the email or letter. So, um, so you do get in touch with the office about that. So there's lots of notices there on the notice sheet. The main one I just want to mention today is that tomorrow is the deadline for joining the electoral roll at church. The electoral roll is our formal membership list. Uh, if this is your church family, it would be great to have you on that list. Um, but what it practically means is that then you can vote in our annual meeting, which is coming up on the 1st of May. So if you want to be able to vote as we select our, our leadership council, and our church wardens, please fill in the electoral roll form, uh, which is also on the table at the back there. Uh, you're basically going to have to do that today. Um, so please do. Um, yeah, as I say, we're electing new church wardens and members of the church council at the APCM on the 1st of May. If you'd like to know more information about those roles, um, uh, that was all detailed in the weekly email this week. So that's the place to look for all of those. Okay. Well, let's move to a time of prayer now. Anthony and Cecilia are going to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Let's pray together, shall we? Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of praying to you today and each day because of the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord of our world, we ask for help, wisdom and guidance for our King Charles his government, and all in authority, nationally and locally. And we pray that all in positions of responsibility will have integrity, will act wisely and humbly, realizing that they're serving under you to bring good to those in our country. And we pray, Sovereign Lord, for your mercy and compassion for people in countries where there's conflict, violence, famine, disease, natural disasters, and for those who are persecuted for their faith in Jesus. We continue to ask for peace in Ukraine, for mercy for your people there, and for restraint by Russia and its leaders. We pray for your mercy and comfort for people of Israel and Gaza in the ongoing conflicts and suffering there. And we remember those who are grieving in Australia after the attack yesterday. There are so troubles in so many parts of our world, and we ask our Father for particular help and strength for Christians who are serving you in those needy places. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord of the nations, we give thanks for our mission partners, Robin and Lorna, serving you in Central Asia, we thank you for the new meeting place for their church, but as it's already too small for accommodating everyone, please help them to find somewhere larger. We ask that their Bible overview course, which has been translated into many local languages, will help people to read the Bible, to understand its truths, and to be changed by it. 
Please also help Robin and Lorna as they work with married couples to grow in their love for each other. And as they travel in this coming week to several places in Central Asia to help and encourage uh, the many local and expat Christians they're meeting, we ask that you will be with them there. Amen. Lord of your church, we pray for our local partner gospel churches, and this, <clears throat> this morning in particular for Christ Church Central, their vicar Tim Davies and other in leadership there. We give thanks for a good mission week last month and for the church growth as they welcome people from many cultures and nations. We pray for blessing on the discipleship courses which will be starting next month and we ask that they will help all those who attend those to understand your word better and to demonstrate your love in their lives. For our own church here, we pray for preparations for the annual church meeting at the beginning of May and for the choice of new church wardens and PCC members, thanking you for those who have served in these roles over recent years. May we as a church fellowship grow in love for our church family, our neighbours, those we meet, demonstrating your care and the joy of knowing our Lord Jesus in whose name we pray. Amen. Merciful Father, we pray for many in our church family who have recently lost loved ones. We ask for them to know your comfort, your peace in their sadness and grief. We thank you for those who have trusted and loved you with the confidence of everlasting life with you. <clears throat> we particularly give thanks this morning for the life of Rosemary Harris, for her many years of faithful service at this church, as well as involvement in the Keswick Convention and other overseas mission organizations. As we have our yearly memorial service next Sunday afternoon, we ask that this will be a time of thanksgiving for those whose loved ones had passed away and of comfort for those grieving their loss. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We praise you, our Father, for the many children and young people who hear about Jesus and the truth of the gospel at the Oaks Christian Holiday Centre. We pray especially for the school groups visiting over the next few months and give thanks for the many schools who continue to book for camps and for the good relationships with school staff. We continue to pray for your blessing on other outreach opportunities in our city and beyond, including street pastors, soup wagon, and food banks. And we pray for the work in prisons with Prison Fellowship and ask for effective measures to stop drugs getting in, destroying lives of prisoners who begin their sentences drug-free and often leave addicts. Thank you, our Father, for the compassion, care, and love of Jesus shared with many needy people through these ministries. Amen. Amen. And God of all comfort, we commend to your love and care <clears throat> all those in our church family who are going through difficult times of illness, worries about finance or family, loneliness, or struggling with difficulties of daily life. Please may they know your peace and love in their situations. And we ask you, Lord, to help each of us to be humble and servant-hearted in our attitudes to one another and to show your love and gentleness wherever it is needed. As we hear the Bible read shortly, please help Will as he explains your word to us and help each of us to listen and act on what you want to say to us. And we bring all these prayers to you. In the precious name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. And shall we now all join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us, the Lord's Prayer. It'll be on the screen. We pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours 
now and forever. Amen. We're going to sing again now, uh, acknowledging that we are not what we should be, but that our hope is in Jesus to shine. He's the light in the darkness who can transform our lives. So let's sing together, shine into our night. This morning's reading is John chapter 21, reading verses 1 to 25, can be found on page 1090 
in the church Bibles. John chapter 21, beginning at verse 1, page 1090. Afterwards, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken it off, and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred metres. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals with fish on it, and some bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish you have just caught. So Simon Peter climbed back into the boat and dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, If I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Because of this, the rumor spread among the believers that this disciple would not die. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He only said, If I want him to remain alive until I return, What is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies to these things and who wrote them down. We know that his testimony is true. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. 
For those who haven't met me before, my name's Will. Uh, I'm on the staff team here, mostly involved in children's, youth, and families ministry. Um, thank you, David, for reading that passage. Please keep that open. I'm going to keep referring back to that as we go along. The passage has got me thinking about some of my fondest memories as a teenager. Um, those memories are set in the Longport Cafe in Canterbury. I grew up about a 45-minute bus journey from Canterbury, and lots of my friends lived there. Um, so when we were old enough to be out at night, we'd, we'd go into town, and that was relatively fun. But for me, the best thing was the following morning, um, taking a walk down to the Longport Cafe together and having a proper breakfast. It was cheap enough for us so we could fill up on coffee, sausages, eggs, bacon, fried toast. It was just what we needed. But beyond the food, it was also a time to sort the good from the bad from the evening before, to recount stories, and then a time to make some plans for the day ahead and to get energized for that. It was a time of being restored together. And I've thought a bit about these memories as I've considered our passage for today. We find a group of friends who are sharing a restorative breakfast, admittedly an altogether more dramatic one uh, than the ones that I enjoyed. But they were similar in that they needed restoring from what was past and they needed energizing for what was to come. And as we gather together this morning, what is going to help us to be restored from all that life has been throwing at us? And what can we do to be re-energized for the coming days and weeks and months? Well, this morning, a bit on from Easter Sunday, we're around 2,000 years on from um, these events with the disciples, but we can still learn a lot from their experience, a few uh, bits on from the first Easter Sunday. Firstly, we can learn from a restorative breakfast. So the setting for this chapter is the Sea of Galilee, and you'll notice there in verse 2 that there are seven disciples there, and they're an interesting bunch of disciples. They could be summed up as a bunch of deniers and doubters and skeptics. So you have um, Simon Peter, firstly, who in chapter 18 denied being a follower of Jesus three times, preferring to look after himself rather than facing um, the trouble that he might get into from identifying with Jesus. And then there's also Thomas, who, uh, as we saw last week in the previous chapter, said, unless I see, I will not believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. And Nathaniel from Cana, he was a skeptic too. When he first heard about Jesus of Nazareth in chapter 1, verse 46, his first comment was, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? And as well as the two unnamed disciples, there are the two sons of Zebedee. Uh, in the other gospel accounts, these two get their mum to ask Jesus that he seats them at his right and left hand in his kingdom. They wanted the glory, but they didn't want the costs that Jesus described he would face of suffering on the cross to serve others first. And this group of flawed disciples are by the Sea of Galilee on their own at night, and verse 3, they go out and they have a very unsuccessful fishing trip. They catch nothing. So a bit like um, Abby in the video from earlier, the disciples, they're weak and they're not altogether much use on their own. They need some energizing and they need some refreshing, which is exactly what comes next. In verses 4 to 6, Jesus arrives on the scene and offers some help. And the turnaround is dramatic. With Jesus, they have an incredibly successful catch. It says they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. What a difference a day makes, goes the famous song. But no number of days would have made the difference for these disciples. Only another encounter with the maker of all things would make the difference. And the encounter is a beautiful one, isn't it? In verse 7, John testifies, it's the Lord. And Peter leaps out of the boat and he splashes over to the shore. I, I love this portrait of Peter in John's gospel. It's just ripe for a comedy series. He seems to be constantly racing around. So in chapter 20, he's sprinting to the tomb with John. And then in this chapter, he is swimming full pelt to the shore. 
And if bikes were around at the time, he would have made a brilliant triathlete. But Peter's response is so good. He knows that where the Lord is, there is goodness and refreshment available. And that's what he and the disciples find. They're met with the risen Jesus. And he says to them in verse 12, come and have breakfast. Jesus serves up bread and fish for them. And I thought after studying this passage that I should um, try um, sort of recreating this for my lunch. Um, I don't think it's a very accurate reconstruction. I'm not sure they would have loved coleslaw back in the day in in Galilee. Um, And to be honest, the best that I can say for it really is that it gave me a bit of energy, but it it wasn't the nicest lunch, I'm not going to lie. I think Jesus would have made a much better bread and fish. So here in the passage are a bunch of disciples who are tired and they're disoriented. They've been on an emotional roller coaster across the Easter weekend. And looking back, they know as well, all too well, their failures. Yet here for them is a meal of restoration and fellowship. Jesus meets them to refresh them, to restore them, and to assure them of forgiveness. What a breakfast this is. This is the one who has made all things. The one who has authority over all things in all the world. The one who by dying on the cross and rising again from the grave has won a victory even over death. And this one continues to serve his people. The same one who deserves to be worshipped by all is the same one who labours over that fire to ensure that his friends are fed. When me and my friends gathered at the Longport Cafe, the night was gone and the day had come. We needed that meal of restoration to prepare us for the new day that was waiting ahead of us. And when the disciples gathered together, the same was true. All their failures and embarrassments and confusion and fear was being consigned to the night. And with the risen Son of God, there was a new day beginning. And this new day was in fact a new age. The age when the message of Jesus Christ, that he'd risen from the dead, would be believed and shared all across the world. And the meal of restoration that the disciples ate then would prepare them for this new age that was lying ahead of them. And we too live in that same age of history. The message of the risen Jesus has reached us and been believed and continues to be shared all around the world. So that breakfast, that first breakfast, really had its full effect. And how does the message find you? Perhaps it finds you in the night. Perhaps we're mindful of the ways that life isn't going to plan. We're not sure what life is all about, where we're heading. We're conscious of our failures to love God and to love others. Perhaps we're fearful or confused about things that are happening to us. Well, Jesus waits at the shore with the same offer of restoration and fellowship with him. In chapter 1, verse 12, John writes of Jesus, To all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There is restoration available to you, available to any who will hear the message and believe in Christ. I remember during my first year and a half, of university, finding myself confused about my place in the world. I couldn't really understand what meaning, if any, there was to life. I wasn't sure who my people were after leaving so many friends and family behind to move to Sheffield. I knew that I wasn't living the kind of joyful, purposeful life that I thought I would find at uni. So when I was invited to read the Bible with a group from church by some friends, it was like coming ashore after a long, tiring, unsuccessful night and finding that there waiting for me was a hot, hearty breakfast. But how does this work? How, what is breakfasting with Jesus actually like for us today, so many years on from Jesus being bodily present on the earth? Well, to understand that, we'll need to look a bit more at Peter and what we learn about a restored shepherd This breakfast is a particularly key moment for Peter. His denial of Jesus three times in chapter 18 brought him face to face with his faithlessness. 
He could no longer hide that he wasn't the strong, brave man that he thought he was. But in fact, he was weak and cowardly. And John brings Peter's failure to mind in verse 9. You might remember when Rob preached um, a few weeks ago on Peter's denial, he pointed out that John uses there the same Greek word for fire in both the account of the denial and this breakfast account. And it's a beautiful detail. So by the same means that Peter would serve himself and deny Jesus, Jesus serves Peter with a meal of fellowship and forgiveness. Then in verses 15 to 18, it's even more clear that Peter's failure is in view. There's the threefold repetition of that question, do you love me? And it's a pointed repetition for Peter who denied Jesus three times. And John brings these details together here to help readers of the New Testament to trust that the words that the New Testament contains are good and true. After all, Peter was to be the foundational apostle for the um, establishing of the church. How could we trust the words of the New Testament if the chief among the disciples that wrote its words was this one, who instead of sticking with Christ, denied him? But Jesus says to Peter, feed my sheep. Peter is restored and reinstated as the one who would help the sheep, the people of God, to be fed. So we find that Jesus entrusts this task to Peter. And if Jesus will, why shouldn't we? And what's more, we see here Not an overly confident, reckless, proud man in Peter, but rather we find a man who has come to the end of himself. His response to Jesus' questions is no longer based on his own strength or knowledge. So you see there in verse 17, this is what he's been saying. Instead of relying on his own knowledge, he has learned to say, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. So the disciples were in exactly the right position to record the words of the New Testament for us because they had given up relying on their own strength and knowledge and wanted merely to pass on the words of the one who was truly strong and knowledgeable. The disciples who testified to the message about Jesus were known as apostles, literally messengers. And their message is here for us in the New Testament. And so if we are looking for health, this is the place we come. We are the sheep that Jesus wants to ensure are fed. How does a sheep go from being a little one like this to being a healthy, sleek sheep like Boaz here? Well, they need to be fed. And in a farming context, how do sheep get food? Well, they need to be shepherded to where there is food. They need to be led and guided towards food in order to be healthy sheep. The equivalent for us of staying healthy spiritually is to be led to feed on Christ by trusted shepherds. Actually, in this passage, John, referred to as the beloved disciple, is probably the best example of that kind of shepherd. Did you see there in verse 7 again? He is the one who testifies It is the Lord. And following his testimony, all the disciples follow and they're led to the breakfast that Jesus provides. So how do we come to Christ to be given strength and purpose? The same way that the disciples always came to Christ. One of them would testify, it's the Lord, and the rest would follow and find that there was Christ. We too must hear the testimony of the disciples and follow their signs to the Christ. It's so encouraging every Sunday to have a building filled with hungry sheep. Why else would we come here except to be filled up with something that is going to sustain us for life? I wonder if our enjoyment of the food spills over into the rest of the week, though. Is it our pattern throughout the week to keep coming back for more and more? Is it what we most want our children and our children's children to enjoy? Is it what we want other people to come and have a taste of? I personally have been challenged when I think about my approach to food. 
I can't remember the last time that I missed one of the three meals in a day. And if I don't get all three meals and probably a snack thrown in as well, I'm not the happiest of people. But to miss out on a chance to engage with the word of God doesn't upset me quite as much. And if one of my friends told me that they'd never had a decent meal in their life, I would want to take them for a decent meal straight away. Yet when they're starving of spiritual food, I'm so very slow to offer them something of Christ. Perhaps we struggle because the Bible is is just not appetizing to us. The thought of it is more like eating gravel or eating salad than eating a slap-up meal. Perhaps we see the Bible as just a lot of difficult sayings and regulations to crunch our way through. I think I'm more prone to see the Bible as something which is good and necessary, but not that enjoyable. I think I'm prone to that, but as I've considered this passage, I've been struck that the problem can't be with the food, but with my taste buds. Here in John 21, as in the rest of John, and as in the rest of the Bible, we encounter not abstract rules and regulations, or irrelevant thoughts from random fishermen, but we encounter the one who has made us, the one who has made all things, the one who continues to be active in the world in an uncountable number of ways. And we encounter the one whose business is not to suck the energy and life out of us, but to fill us with his love and his life. Our taste buds are naturally off but we have a God who is always ready to help us as we ask for his help. Let's keep praying that God would help us to really enjoy encountering him in the Bible. And let's trust too that as we come to Christ again and again through the words of the apostles, we'll come to pick up more and more of its sweetness and enjoy it. And this kind of encounter with God makes all the difference as well. As we'll see in this last section of the passage, the refreshment of being fed by Jesus transforms people. It transforms us. And we learn of a restored community. So looking at verses 18 to 23, you'll see there that Peter is called to follow Jesus. And John also follows, walking behind them. Jesus says to them that their ministry is going to look different. Peter is given a clear indication by Jesus that his service of sheep feeding is going to result in him dying. But Peter is not only concerned with his life, he's also concerned to find out what is going to happen to John, the one who he's been so closely associated with throughout the last few chapters of the gospel. And he asks there in verse 21, Lord, what about him? What about John? But Jesus is clear that Peter needs to think differently about this situation, saying, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. Jesus is clear that although the ministry of the apostles is going to look different, it should never cause competition between them. Their goal should be to take care of the sheep in the way that they are called. So John is helping us again to trust the words of the apostles, Although the temptation has been present throughout the ages for the church to elevate one of the apostles over the others, John's gospel shows us that the ministry of each one, though different, is to be received because it is authenticated and directed by Jesus himself. So we mustn't play off Peter against John or Luke against Paul or even Paul against Jesus since they had the complementary aims of honoring God and serving the flock of God. John did go on to honor God and to serve the flock of God. We here are being served by him. We have been served by him as we've looked at his gospel over the last month or so. And we know from his letters that are found a few pages on in the New Testament that he had learnt from Jesus to love. His letters are full of overflowing love for the flock of God and he wants them to grow in their love too. In his first letter, 1 John 4 verse 11, he says, Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. The love of God creates a body of people who are loved and who are transformed to love one another. Um, I've got a diagram up here of 
a healthy ecosystem versus a not so healthy ecosystem. And the beauty of a healthy ecosystem is that when it's working well, you've got there a diversity of species that are provided for and they grow well together alongside the others, but the input of the ecosystem is key. If there's healthy nutrition going into the ecosystem, it thrives. Otherwise, it struggles. Thanks, Marie. Um, in a similar way, the disciples, they were going to be healthy when they were well fed by that breakfast. It was a sim symbolic of the way that their life and health as disciples came from Jesus. And being well provided for, they were in a position to lovingly serve the flock of God in their diverse ways. And we too may have our diverse ways and opportunities for serving. Chiefly, we are called to serve one another in love. And one key way that we do that is by growing in humility. And we can see how the disciples here were being grown in humility. That competition that had bubbled up between Peter and John was no longer going to work since both of them had come to realize that their best and their only boast was that they were loved by Jesus. And any competitiveness and comparing ourselves against one another has to be rooted out. I know that I am all too guilty of looking down on others and wanting to be considered the best, not necessarily outwardly, but certainly in my head. Yet having heard over the last few months of the incredible love of the Son of God, that he would willingly stoop as low as to serve us by dying on the cross, I hope and pray that we will consider our best and only best, uh, only boast to be that we have been loved by Jesus. And we need to see more and more of just what a wonderful thing it is to be loved by Jesus, given how amazing he is. So in verse 25, John says, there wouldn't be room in all the universe to contain what, would be written, what could be written about Christ. And I confess that when I read that, I sort of thought to myself, yeah, nice one, John. Good bit of hyperbole to finish off a very poetic gospel. But no wonder I will look down on others when my view of Jesus is that small. I was challenged as I read the commentaries to stop being so blockheaded and remember that John is talking about the eternal, infinite word of God that he introduced us to way back in chapter one. Jesus is the very word by which the whole universe was created and is upheld. So as Don Carson says in his commentary, if all his deeds were described, the world would be a very small and inadequate library indeed. Jesus is everything and more that we need for our health and satisfaction. And in this age where Jesus has died and he's risen and we're waiting for him to return, he is what we need every day for our health and satisfaction. And he is readily available to us through the words of the apostles. So let's pray that God would help us to be restored and re-energized by Christ to love one another. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus. Thank you that in him we find uh, everything that we need. And thank you that through the words of the apostles, we can meet with your son, risen and reigning over all things, and be strengthened. Please, in the days, weeks, months ahead, would you strengthen us to be those who love you and who love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. We're going to sing some more songs now. We're going to sing All My Boast is in Jesus and then His Mercy in, is more. Let's stand and sing.
Take your seats. Well, that's the end of our time together today. Uh, please don't rush off. We'll have teas and coffees served over in the lounge in the church centre, so do uh, head over there and uh, join in for that. Let me close with a prayer. Almighty Father, who in your great mercy gladdened the disciples with the sight of the risen Lord, Give us such knowledge of his presence with us that we may be strengthened and sustained by his risen life and serve you continually in righteousness and truth through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
strength to follow your commands could never come from me oh father use my ransom life in any way you choose and let my song forever be my only boast is you Jesus is